Okay, let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Williams. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Contrast Security. And uh, I've been working with OWASP since the beginning of OWASP. I was one of the founders of OWASP, and I was the global chair for, the, you know, for nine years while we were getting OWASP off the ground. But I haven't really done much with OWASP in the last, you know, I don't know, six or seven years. So uh, I, I still love OWASP a lot. I, I, uh, it's one of the best things that I feel like I've done in my career. I'm, so I'm extremely excited and proud to be speaking here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, building a DevSecOps pipeline. And uh, I'll just start by saying I think that DevOps is, is one of the most transformative things that's happened to software since object-oriented programming came out. I mean, it's really like that level of transformation. Some of you may be too young to remember before, but we used to do a different kind of programming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, so uh, let's jump into it here a little bit. Um, I wanted to start by given a sense of what the average application looks like. Now, I've represented it here as an iceberg. And what's below the water is libraries and frameworks, uh, you know, open source code primarily. And above the, above the water line is your custom code. And I think it's interesting to just look at where the vulnerabilities fall in this, uh, in this iceberg. Most of them are above the water line. Average application has 26.7 vulnerabilities in his custom code. That is bananas, by the way. That is an insane level of vulnerability. And this has been true, by the way, for the last 15 years. It's roughly that number of you know, like truly verified vulnerabilities. It hasn't gone up and down very much over that time. Um, can you imagine if we were like the airline industry, and every time you tested a plane, it had 26.7 safety problems? That's nuts. We're producing massively vulnerable code, and it's almost all basic blocking and tackling. I wrote the OWASP Top 10 in 2002. That's 16 years ago, and it's still the same shit in there. I had this idea like, oh, well, we'll put the Top 10 out there, and then we'll do that for a few years, and we'll raise the bar, and then we'll add a few, and like, over time, we'll just get better. But we haven't. And sometimes when you try to create a floor, you actually end up creating a ceiling. So now, like, the OS Top 10 is kind of aspirational for most organizations, which is awful and an unintended side effect of what I was trying to do there. Um, and a lot of people are talking about, you know, library vulnerabilities, which I think are really important, but let's just remember that's, like, one of the OS Top 10. So, you know, I think it's, it's an easy to understand problem, so people rush out and they're like, oh, well, we got to make sure we're not using libraries with known vulnerabilities. And you can buy tools that are good at that because it's a simple problem. And you know, maybe you can put some effort into that. But really, you're not pushing the ball very far down the field if that's the only problem that you solve. And you can see why in the iceberg. And in fact, it's actually even worse than this. Because if you look, 79% you know, of the code is below the waterline. And so people say, like, focus on the big part of the code, right? But really, almost all of that code is unused. That library code almost never gets called. So only a tiny fraction of it actually ever gets invoked. And there are far fewer vulnerabilities in that part. So if you get a tool that says, hey, you're using 25 out-of-date libraries. You need to replace them all. Well, it's a pretty good chance that you're not actually invoking the code in those libraries at all anyway. So those are really a weird kind of false alarm. So be careful on where you, you focus your efforts in AppSec. The other side of this is that attacks are out there. If you actually look, if you put measure, measurements on your applications and try to measure who's actually attacking you and what kind of techniques they're using, you'll see every application out there gets attacked every single month. This is our, our results from uh, last month uh, across maybe 20,000 applications. And you can see there's, there's a huge level of attack. This is the likelihood that the application will see an attack in that category, right? So, more than half the applications see SQL injection attacks. More than that sees you know, path traversal and reflected XSS. There's a ton of scanning going on, on there. Anybody know what that, uh, that first CVE is, by the way, that 5638? Nobody? That's Equifax. That's the breach that took down Equifax. And you've got to be aware, the day after that vulnerability was disclosed at an OWASP event, uh, it started getting immediately attacked 
broad scale attacks across the internet within a day. And that's the new reality, is that folks are looking for new vulnerability disclosures, they read the disclosure, they reverse engineer an attack, and then they start bombarding the internet to try to find vulnerabilities, uh, or, you know, find you know, folks that are vulnerable to that. So you, you got to have a process in place for dealing with these new vulnerabilities that are coming out uh, very quickly. So look, that's a bad situation. If we got a lot of vulnerabilities and there's a lot of attacks out there, that's a recipe for disaster. So uh, we got to do better. We got to do basic blocking and tackling to deal with some of these problems that we've known about for at least 20 years, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, command injection, uh, path traversal, and so on, these are not new vulnerabilities. <laughs> so here's the problem. Traditional application security doesn't really work. Uh, I, I, I'm guilty here. I ran a consulting company for 15 years, and we did all the services, everything that's in the, you know, the maturity models. We did threat modeling and architecture reviews and code review and pen testing and training and uh, you know, automation and AppSec programs and all, all this stuff. I've done it all. And by and large, I have to say I don't think it works very well. And the results show that. Like We can't keep doing what we've been doing because it doesn't work. We're not getting the results that we really want. Ultimately, I think here's the problem is if you've got a, any kind of decent sized portfolio of applications, if you're trying to shove it through a traditional AppSec program, which is built with experts and tools for experts, you're doomed. Because there's not enough experts. Anytime you do anything that requires an expert involved in the critical path to getting code into production, you're screwed. Because you've got an instant bottleneck. And there's nothing that you can do to scale it. So ultimately, my talk here today is about getting you to see that we have to get security experts off the critical path. We have gotta be able to push code into production without me or you in the critical path. That means your job changes. You can't be the guy that's finding the XSS. You've gotta be more like a coach or a toolsmith in order to help get that pipeline automated. And you know, if you've got a bottleneck kind of process, what we see in almost every organization is that they only focus on a subset of their application portfolio. Anybody got an organization where they're only looking at like the criticals? You know, the high risk applications? Maybe some organizations, they're like, well, that's just the ones that are external facing. Some of the smarter ones are like, well, it's the external facing ones, but it's also some of the internal ones that are really valuable because that's, you know, that's a high impact to us. But however you figure it out, they're only looking at a subset of the apps. And then what happens is that's still too much for this approach to work. And so then they have to start lowering the bar. Right? And all of a sudden now you're configuring your tools to not false alarm so much. Anybody done that? Hey, you start turning off rules and pretty soon you've got an incredibly expensive XSS detector. And that's where we're putting all this effort and work into building a program that's ultimately not delivering what we want. And I think we all know what we want. If you want to ma imagine the, the outcome that you really want. You want all of your applications in your portfolio, and you want to be relatively sure that they're not vulnerable to attack, and that they're protected if they are attacked. That's the goal, but we're not getting anywhere close to that with the current program. So, uh, I think DevSecOps is incredibly promising. DevOps transformed software development, and DevSecOps can transform security. But it's not just shoving legacy security tools into DevOps. Uh, Larry Maccheroni from Comcast, he calls that uh, lipstick, DevOps lipstick on a pig. <laughs> right? It's automating the scan button is not going to get us there. Because it doesn't really solve the problems with the expert group. And we'll get to that in just a second. But the, the big transformations with DevOps were taking a, a software process that uh, you know, is big, monolithic, and not very, you know, not very agile, not very uh, many feedback loops, and transforming it. They took the work and broke it down into little pieces that you can deliver. Now, can we do that for security? Sure, but we don't. A pen test is like this big chunk of work, right? Security architecture is a big chunk of work that we do all as one big giant thing. We got to break that down, the little pieces that we can deliver all the way, piece by piece. 
Uh, and as we'll see, a lot of that work can be done without security experts. <laughs> So that's the first thing, is getting security work flowing. Because right now, it's not flowing. We do it you know, at the end of the life cycle. It's a big effort. It's a long feedback loop. It's all the same problems the software had. So that's the first step. We've got to break down security work into little pieces that are valuable. The second thing is we've got to ensure instant feedback. A lot of the feedback that we give is way too late. Have you ever anybody seen that curve where it says, like, you know, a security vulnerability costs X in, uh, if you find it in requirements or development, and then it's like 10X if you find it in test, and uh, you know, 100X if you find it in production. Well, that chart is all wrong, because it's not a straight line. About half an hour after that code gets committed, the cost goes up by like a, a zillion times, right? Because once it's committed, developers on to the next thing. If they can fix it in stride while they're programming, costs almost nothing, but it immediately goes up. So the, the curve's wrong. But the point is right. Like we got to get super early in the process, get these uh, problems fixed instantly. And then the last thing is in, in, for DevOps is to create this culture of experimentation and learning. And that's also something that we really struggle with in security, is most security is done based on standards that are kind of backwards looking, you know, like the OS top 10. <laughs> it looks backwards at like what, what vulnerabilities do you have? It's not thinking about what's the threat going to be in three years or five years when the system is out being deployed. We're not building for that threat. We're building for the threat from three years ago or more. Audit driven AppSec is really a bad idea. So we can build a culture of experimentation and learning, but we got to allow everybody to say, hey, that's a, you know, that's a potential Vulnerability. Comment on the threat model. Make it concrete. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I think this is really promising. This is not what this talk is about. Uh, if you're interested, I wrote a ref card about this, a D-Zone that you can download. It's intro to DevSecOps. And there's some other materials out there that I think are good. Um, I just wanted to throw this up there. As I, I, I encourage you to look at pictures of DevSecOps that are out there. Because there's a lot of different you know, reference architectures and pipelines that people are trying to draw. But they're, they're all super complicated. They've got a zillion tools. Uh, and then they're trying to take all those tools and shove them together and uh, orchestrate that process. If you look at Gartner's process, for instance, they're basically like, well, you've got to buy one of every single kind of tool. And then you need an orchestration tool to run all those tools. And then you need another tool to take all the results of all those tools and correlate them and uh, you know, analyze them so that you can make, get value out. That's bananas. Nobody has, that's not going to work. Nobody has enough people to run all those tools, much less. See this little uh, icon at the top? This is AppSec Analyst False Positive Remover. <laughs> that bubble should be like 80 or 90% of this screen. Because <laughs> that's all the work. I know many organizations have teams. I know one organization's got over 50 people. All they do is take the output of static analysis tools and weed out the false positives. Not only is that a sort of a miserable existence, it's not, a, it's not automated. If you have to have a human in the loop, it's by definition it's not automated. So we're, we're failing on that. So just look at these pictures with a skeptical eye. If they're, I call this tool soup. And tool soup is not a knapsack strategy. You can't just take a zillion tools and throw it at the problem and expect value to come out. So I wanna, I, the last speaker talked about starting with the end in mind. And I want to do that here, too. So when I think about a DevSecOps pipeline, for me, it's three parts. In development, we want to empower developers to create secure code and check it in clean. Right? I think we can all probably agree on that. To me, that means it's got to, it's got to do significant testing. It's got to be accurate, because uh, you know, they, they don't have the expertise to, to deal with false positives. Uh, it's got to provide them feedback through the tools they're already using. We can't have them go to some separate dashboard. And it can't slow them down. So that's in development. If we could give developers instant feedback that say, hey, you committed SQL injection on right here, and here's what you need to do to fix it, and they can just fix it and check it in clean, then that's a process that I think we can, that, that can work. Uh, I'll show you how in just a second. That's, that's part two. So the next thing is in the integration environment or QA environment, this is where I think you want to be a little bit more formal, right? In development, you don't want to track all those vulnerabilities and put in extra work on those. You should fix them and get them out of the way. 
just like any other, any other software problem. But in integration, I think you don't, you don't want to slow down builds. Uh, you do want to integrate with normal testing tools. And you should be a little bit more formal. Like you might want to break the build. You might want to create JIRA tickets at this point for issues and track them to closure so that you can deliver assured software into production. So I, I don't think it's like shift left is kind of the wrong language for me. It's, it's a useful analogy, but it's not just about shifting left. It's about you know, starting left, but you also have to, to do more security in QA. And we'll actually talk about in pr production. I mean, AppSec doesn't stop when you deliver the code, right? Like there's a whole attack world out there. And I think organizations are really lacking in this. I think most organizations don't know who's attacking them or what attack vectors they're using. I think they don't know much about uh, you know, how, how people are, are approaching the application. Um, I think they want protection in production. Uh, and that's not just for known vulnerabilities, but for new stuff that comes out. You want to be able to deploy a protection really fast. Like someone today, some researcher could release some new zero day in struts or spring. And guess what? Half the applications out there now are going to be vulnerable to some new crazy attack. And most organizations aren't going to be able to respond to that any faster than Equifax did. They're going to have to pull their apps out of production. They're going to have to get the new library, add it to the application, rewrite the code to match the new library. Because you don't patch open source. You issue a new open source library. And then they're going to have to do their testing and QA and security and then push it into production. That takes a long time. If you've got 50 apps written with Spring, that is a massive distraction. Uh, and so we need something to deal with that in the operational side of things. So if we can do with it, if we can do this, I think we'd be in pretty good shape. So now I'm going to try and tell you how I see that happening. We got to start with instrumentation. So there's a shift going on uh, in the security world, and not just in application security, but kind of everywhere, to move from scanning and firewalls to instrumentation. So scanning and firewalls kind of works at the perimeter, right? You're looking at network traffic or HTTP traffic to try to identify attacks and vulnerabilities. Uh, and you don't have a ton of information about what's really going on. A better approach is to instrument the thing that you're actually trying to protect. So at the application layer, we can instrument the actual app and look at how it runs. At other layers, there's, you know, the container layer, there's products like Aqua and Twist Lock. At the host layer, there's, you know, things like Carbon Black, which are instrumenting. Even at the, the network layer, there's products from AWS and so on that, uh, and VMware that can, can uh, give you direct analysis of the thing that you're trying to protect. And so to me, the modern security stack looks like this, and it protects itself. You can take that stack and you can move it. You can put it in your data center. You can put it in the cloud. You can put it in an elastic environment. The protection goes with the thing that you're trying to protect. The idea of having a perimeter around everything is fundamentally flawed. Because always what happens is wherever you put the perimeter, then all of a sudden you've got to run a whole bunch of connections in and out. Somebody wants to run a browser from inside the perimeter, and then you're screwed. One, one employee gets knocked over. And now the attacker is inside your internet, and you know, the, the whole thing crumbles. So this, to me, is the way uh, uh, out of that. Ed Amoroso does some great talks. He's the former CISO of AT&T. Uh, now he runs a, a thing called Tag Cyber. But he talks about this process of offload, uh, uh, sorry, ex explode, offload, reload. And explode is basically taking the stuff that's inside the perimeter and blowing it up. Take those workloads, move them into the cloud. That's offload. And then uh, reload is adding new modern security protections to that stack so that your applications are protected wherever they are. And then it doesn't matter. Anybody here still talk about like internal apps versus external apps? OK, if there's no perimeter, then that distinction doesn't make any sense. There is no internal and no external, right? So I really want you to think about every app is just out there on the internet, and how are you going to protect it? Because uh, the perimeter doesn't really provide that distinction. So I, I don't like when people talk about internal and external. OK, so at the application layer, let's talk about instrumentation-based approaches to security. So I'm going to talk about two technologies here, IAST and RASP. 
Uh, who's heard of IAST and RASP? Okay, so maybe half. That's great. So fundamentally, these technologies are very different than traditional SAS, DAST, and WAF technologies. So IAST is, uh, uh, is interactive application security testing. I actually think of it as instrumented application security testing. So for me, that's a bit more descriptive. And the whole idea of IAST is to detect vulnerabilities. It does the same kinds of things that SAS and DAST would do, just very differently. And RASP is about preventing vulnerabilities from being exploited. So this is, does the kinds of things that a WAF would do, but from inside the running application. So the way this works is you'll add a IAST and RASP agent to your application. And you know, this, like for Java, it could be a jar file. For if Ruby, it could be a gem. It's, it's an application component. And what it does is it instruments the application with sensors. And then those sensors uh, watch the application run. And they can provide that telemetry to an engine that can detect vulnerabilities very accurately and detect attacks very accurately and, and prevent those attacks from working. So let me give you an example um, of a SQL injection attack. So uh, the attacker sends in an attack, maybe it's like, you know, single tick or one equals one, something like that. And uh, that data, it's not trying to block it at the perimeter. Because if you try to block it at the perimeter, you're always going to be inaccurate. You don't know, maybe that was a blog post that had, you know, single tick or one equals one in it. It wasn't going into the database, it's just normal data. So, you know, modern applications take complex data, JSON and serialized objects and so on. So you can never really be sure what's in them. So trying to block at the perimeter isn't a great idea, but from inside the app, you can see, hey, that data flowed through and ended up in a SQL query. If that data from the attacker changes the meaning of the query, and I ask can analyze that from, uh, RASP can analyze that from inside the app, then that's the definition of SQL injection, right? An attacker should never be able to change the meaning of your queries. That's what SQL injection is. And that's what RASP can protect. So instead of trying to guess, like, is this an attack and having this false alarm problem, RASP can see exactly when there's an attack and prevent it from exploiting. So then, then the RASP can intervene and prevent that query from going to the database, right? So defense from inside the application, it's got a lot more context, a lot more information, it can be more accurate. Now, I asked works similarly, and this is a little bit more tricky to get your head around. So now I want you to imagine that there's just a developer just writing their code. And they don't, they don't know how to attack the application because they're not security experts. They don't know about single tick or one equals one. They just type in normal data, like they might type in the word Jeff. Well, I asked can track that data, like taint tracing, and track that data through to where it lands in a SQL query. And then the IAST can look back across that data's history and say, hey, was this data ever escaped or parameterized in a way that would have stopped SQL injection? And if it hasn't been protected, then we know that that's an exploitable path through the application. It's a way to get data t into a query, and there's no defenses on that path. So you can very accurately identify uh, vulnerabilities in applications this way, too. And again, we didn't have to be experts in security here. Anybody can do this. Um, any, I'll just pause here. For, I want to make sure everybody's with me. Every, everybody understand IAST and RASP here? So we've instrumented the security directly into the application. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at how can we use those technologies to create a full DevSecOps pipeline. So this is a pipeline for Spring Pet Clinic. And it's pretty simple. It's, you know, the code's in GitHub. Uh, we'll use uh, normal development tools like Eclipse and Slack and so on in our development environment. Uh, we'll build it with Jenkins. We've got bug trackers and Sonar Cube and stuff like that. Uh, we'll use some testing with Selenium and things like that. Uh, and then we'll push this into Pivotal Cloud Foundry to run. And we're using, you know, typical SIM. Uh, we'll use Splunk and, and so on in that environment. So this is our, our pipeline. And we want to add security to this. So what we're going to do is we're going to add IAST in the development environment. This will give us visibility into vulnerabilities instantly as we're just writing our code and doing our normal job. Then in the CICD environment, we're going to add both IAST and RASP. 
And IAST is easy to understand. We want to know if there's any vulnerabilities that somehow snuck out of development and made it into the QA environment. But we'll also run RASP here because we want to make sure that we've fully tested our application with all the defenses turned on. And then we deploy exactly what we tested. Okay? So this is a way to get great confidence that uh, you know, security is in place and working. And then in production, we'll one, run with RASP in place and we'll have uh, attack detection and prevention in, uh, in production. And the good news is this is really easy. Uh, anyone can do this pretty quickly. So I'm going to demonstrate this. Uh, this is the demo portion. So I've got three screens here. I've got a development environment, conveniently labeled with the word development at the top. Uh, I've got a CICD environment, and I've got a production environment. So just so people don't get confused, I switch environments back and forth a little bit. So that's, that's your uh, bird watching guide. So here I'm, I've got an application, the Spring Pet Clinic app in Eclipse. And uh, I want to get started, so I'm going to add IAST to this environment. So the first step is to go download an IAST and RASP agent. Uh, I'm going to use the one from my company, Contrast. Uh, this is the Contrast Community Edition. It's free uh, and full strength for anybody who wants to try this. So um, that's, but you could use other IAST and RASP agents here as well. And uh, the first step is to add the agent to the environment. So I've downloaded this contrast.jar file, and I've added it to my project here, and I just need to configure it so that when we run this application, contrast runs along with it. So in this case, this is a Spring Boot application, so we can add it in the palm this way so that every time we launch with Spring Boot, we're going to add this Java agent flag to the way the application runs. Now, Java agent flag is pretty standard. Uh, this is exactly the way that you add tools like New Relic and AppDynamics to applications on the performance side. We're just doing exactly that same thing for security here. So we add this agent and a couple other uh, configuration options here. And then I'm just going to run this application normally. Um, so as the application starts up, this I asked agent is in the background. It's instrumenting the code as it loads. So when it runs in memory, it's now instrumented for security, and everything happens automatically in the background. It'll just start testing itself. Like once I do this, this application is now protected uh, from this point forward. And you don't have to change anything about the way you build, test, or deploy your code here to, to do this. So uh, application's now started up. So. Uh, this is the first time that I've brought this application online. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of starting fresh here. And you can see I actually have a contrast plugin in the IDE. And you can see there's no vulnerabilities here yet. So all I have to do is browse around and just use this application normally. So I'll put uh, LastCon here. And you can see, you'll see Slack alerts start coming in for vulnerabilities uh, as we use this application. So I'm just going to put in some normal data here. And again, this is a lot different than you know, having to have a pen tester to, uh, to do this um, because you don't need to know anything about security. And ultimately, that's really the key, is if your tool requires uh, any kind of security expertise, then you, you can't really give it to developers. We need tools for novice software developers so that novice developers can write and commit clean code. Otherwise, it just won't scale. So uh, look, I'm just adding a couple little, uh, little fields here to, uh, to make sure we get some coverage data. And uh, you know, click on a couple links. All you have to do is just use this functionality the normal way. And uh, IS is in the background doing the testing. So now if I, I refresh this, Contrast has already identified a bunch of interesting vulnerabilities. And uh, th that's what IAST can do. Uh, because it's directly measuring the running application, much more accurate than traditional tools like SAST and DAST. So here you can see uh, found a hibernate injection, uh, some cross-site request forgery on three pages, uh, stored cross-site scripting. By the way, stored cross-site scripting is really tricky to find <laughs> because you know, for traditional tools, it's one thread that puts the, the untrusted data in the database and another thread that pulls it out and renders it. So the tools can't connect those things. But uh, because it's, we're running inside the app, it's easy for tools like IS to see. Hard-coded password, parameter pollution. And, and notice here, this is a range of different kinds of vulnerabilities. 
uh, DAS tools are good at finding things that are obvious in HTTP traffic, right? Things like parameter pollution and uh, failure to use autocomplete and uh, you, know, you didn't use uh, X frame options to stop click jacking, stuff like that, it's obvious to a DAS tool, but very difficult for a SAS tool to find. SAS tools, on the other hand, are, are good at things like uh, hard-coded passwords, weak encryption algorithm. Those are obvious in the code. So that's the place to look for those. And uh, really, none of those tools are very good at data flow problems. Data flow problems are like all the injections, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, uh, XPath injection, LDAP injection, command injection, uh, serialized object, every, everything like that. Um, and so we need a different solution to try to do data flow analysis. And all three of these things are, are built inside the IAST technology. So we get all different views of the application. So here, you know, let's drill down into one of these uh, vulnerabilities. So when I, I open up this Hibernate injection, uh, we get the details. And I'm going to zoom in. Maybe this will work. Sometimes I can, I can scroll in. Does that scroll? Ah, oh, God. OK, so this tells a little story about what the IAST engine was able to see. It says, here's some of the HTTP requests. We saw some untrusted data come in in this last name parameter where I typed in last con. And that data was accessed on you know, this method and this line of code. And it ended up in this Hibernate query without going through any kind of escaping or parameterization. If it had been escaped or parameterized somehow, the IAST engine would have seen it, and it wouldn't have reported this vulnerability. So this is uh, really good proof that this is a real exploitable vulnerability. Because you can actually see it. You can see the data flow through. Now, a, a, a DAS tool would only show you the top line up there. A static tool would only show you, you know, kind of the, the method and the line of code, but you have no idea how to test it. And the, the last line here is no other tool can really show you that full query with the actual data in it. So this is a much richer kind of finding than uh, other tools provide. Um, and of course, you know, the, the tools provide things like the, the details on how to fix it, uh, the full HTTP request. Uh, so you have a test case that you can use to verify that you fixed it correctly. And then uh, this events tab, I think, is interesting. This shows the, the full path through the application for this vulnerability. This shows you know, where the data was read in in this uh, get parameter values method, the full stack trace for that, and all the runtime state. Uh, at the end, the last step is the, uh, you know, the actual create query call that went to the database. And in between, there's a bunch of string operations here. Any of these you can double click on and go right to the line of code where the problem is. So in this case, you can see this is where this con concatenated query got built and where the developer would make the fix. Okay. So again, anybody can use this. The goal here is that IAST is usable by any novice developer. And I'll tell you a story about my son. Uh, he's in high school. He's uh, building. He's in a programming class, and so he built his first Java EE application. This is for his school's writing center. And uh, he came to me and said, "Hey, it's ready. I want to put it on online." I was like, "Whoa! <laughs> Let's just check it out first. Go, you know." grab a copy of Contrast and, and, and run it and see what happens. He came back like half an hour later. He goes, well, oh, Dad, I had four cross-site scriptings and two SQL injections. He talks like that because he's a teenager. And uh, <laughs> so I was like, oh, son, that's OK. It happens. Uh, you know. And uh, he's like, but it's OK. I fixed it. And I'm like, holy shit, that's exactly what we need is novice developers who can find and fix their own vulnerabilities, check in clean code. That's the key to getting this right in development. OK? Um, so I think it's important to get this, this data to the developers through the tools they're already using. I think Slack is a good vehicle for this. You can see here some of the vulnerabilities we just found um, in Slack with all the, you know, here's the stored cross site scripting uh, information. Um, and so that's, that's a nice vehicle to alert a team about a new vulnerability. Uh, there's also a way of, of doing this through. Uh, you know, right through the, uh, the browser, which I think is kind of interesting. In this case, this is that page that was vulnerable. And uh, you can get a browser plugin here to pull down. And this will show you just the vulnerabilities associated with this page. Um, so I think that's really powerful. Like, this is the page with that Hibernate injection. So this is a nice way to communicate with development teams is to show them right in their UI that they're using all the time where the vulnerabilities are. So this is, this is kind of powerful. 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if, you, if you're interested in uh, what tools are good at and what they're not good at, go check out the OS Benchmark project. These guys built 3,000 test cases uh, a few years ago to test what static and dynamic tools are good at. Uh, and it's not a hard test. It's relatively easy. They're, half the test is false positives, half the test is true positives. And you just, you know, you can clone the Git repository, run your tool, get the report, feed it back into the benchmark, and it'll grade that report for you and tell you what they got right and what they got wrong. This will tell you what your tools are good at and what they're not good at. I do hear people using, you know, tools for security like, you know, find, uh, find bugs with security bugs. Uh, the benchmark will tell you exactly what that tool is good at and what it's not good at. And it's interesting. You know, you look at things like insecure cookies and weak random numbers, it's awesome. FindBugs is super at that. But when you get to the harder things like you know, the data flow problems like command injection and SQL injection and edge path injection and things like that, they're, they're way over. It's, it's barely better than guessing. And so you, know, you should know. If you're going to trust these tools with the security of your enterprise, you should know what they're good at. And there's no, there's no other way to do this. You can't use WebGoat. I wrote WebGoat, by the way, in 1999, if any of you have used it. Uh, you can't use WebGoat to test a security tool. It's got a very narrow set of vulnerabilities to test for. So you need to use something that tests a broad range of, of vulnerabilities. And like I said, this is a super easy test. If the tools aren't acing this test, they're really, it just doesn't prove that your tool is never going to find a false positive or anything. But I asked, uh, tends to do very, very well against this. Okay, so um, I'm going to shift to the, uh, the uh, CICD environment. First, what I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to say, like, uh, browsing the application to find vulnerabilities, that's convenient for developers, but you also want a reliable way of checking to make sure your app doesn't have vulnerabilities. You want to make sure you, you cover everything. So uh, I asked runs every time you use the application, I'm going to run a set of test cases here. Uh, in the background, and it runs with contrast. Actually, uh, the configuration's in the palm. It, uh, this is under the Surefire plugin. So you just add the, the, uh, the contrast jar here the same way. I also add Jococo as a code coverage agent, because you should really know about code coverage if you're doing security testing. If you're doing a pen test or a dynamic scan, you should absolutely have code coverage hooked up so you know really what you've got. And, uh, you should, I mean, static tools don't tell you what they cover and what they miss, but they miss a lot. So it, it's actually impossible to really know. But uh, this means every time I check in code, this, these tests will run. And I've got, uh, let's see, I've got uh, Jenkins here. And so every time I run, and I'll start a build now, every time I run a build, all my test cases run. And I asked, as in the background, testing every single uh, interaction with the application that happens. So it's like getting security testing for free. And uh, so I think security should be a little bit more formal here in, uh, in the CICD environment. You want a, a good test that you checked everything. So I think this is a good place to automatically create JIRA tickets. Like if you weed out, say, 80 or 90% of the vulnerabilities in dev, you're checking in cleaner code. Now when you find something in QA, you create a ticket, track it, make, make sure it gets closed. And uh, there are good integrations from IAST right into uh, bug tracking tools with all the details that a developer would need. So you know, really the goal here is developers should never be looking at your security tools. <laughs> right? They should get security information just like they get every other bug, right through the tools that they're already using. That's the least disruptive thing that we can do. And uh, I, I'll show the code coverage results here. I think this is really interesting. You know, this says, for the most part, I'm getting pretty good code coverage. But I've got, obviously, one big class here that I'm not getting code coverage in. And I should probably write a, a test case for that. You can even drill down here and get uh, the details of exactly what lines of code are executed by your test cases and so on. So it, you know, this can help you drive towards really good code coverage. And IS doesn't need full test cases. IS just needs you know, basic execution of the web functionality. So you know, a simple crawler like uh, 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 Arachne. <laughs> Sorry. Arachne you can run without uh, you know, running the vulnerability tests because you don't need them. But you can use that to crawl the application and get really good coverage over an application. Um, OK, so uh, I want to show you this in, uh, in the 
contrast dashboard. Again, this is the, the uh, free community edition of contrast. And we built this dashboard since the start of this talk. What this shows is for Spring Pet Clinic, we started this dashboard. And you can see we've found a bunch of vulnerabilities in development. We're also looking at what's going on in QA. This is kind of a sign of an unhealthy project, right? Because we didn't shift left. We're still finding a ton of vulnerabilities in the QA environment. So this is a project where we can go in and maybe do some training, maybe help folks understand how to use the technology a little better, and get those vulnerabilities fixed in dev when they come up. Uh, getting this kind of visibility from other tools will be really hard. Like I don't know anybody who runs static in, in dev and static in QA and continuously compares the results to see which one's doing better. I think that would be really hard. Um, and I also wanted to show here the, uh, the library analysis. Uh, this is really important. You should know exactly what code you're running across your entire enterprise. And that's one of the things that IS tools do is they can just uh, directly measure the libraries that are being used by your applications, pull that all together, and build a global database of all the libraries that you've got. In this case, you can see uh, you know, I've got a bunch of libraries here. How many does it say? Oh, oh, hold on, open that up. So I've got uh, you know, 132 libraries with 15 known vulnerabilities across 10 libraries. And if I want to just filter down and see which the vulnerable libraries are, I can pull that up. And then this is kind of interesting. Remember I said most libraries aren't used? Well, if we look at these vulnerable ones, and you can see you know, the, the CVEs uh, listed here. You know, this uh, Jackson has five different CVEs associated with it. But we can also see how much of those libraries are actually used, right? So this shows you the number of classes used out of those libraries. And, you know, I think four of these are used, but the other six, they're huge. They have vulnerabilities, but they're completely unused by the Spring Pet Clinic application. They're just there because of compile time dependency. Uh, they're never invoked. So these are libraries that you probably don't want to rush out and fix because it's a waste of effort. Maybe you should update them eventually, but you know, uh, no rush. OK, so that's uh, automated testing in, in uh, QA, CI, CI, CD environment. Let's switch gears and, and jump over to production here. Now, remember, this is RASP, Runtime Application Self-Protection, that's protecting these applications. and. Uh, Here's the data that's, you know, this is data coming into Splunk off uh, these applications. And you can see some attacks are blocked, some are uh, ineffective, and some are actually exploited here. And the reason for that exploited bit is you can run, like a WAF, you can run RASP in a log-only mode if you want. Um, and, you know, you should have a dashboard that shows you exactly uh, how you're being attacked and who's attacking you and, and so on. So let's take a look at how RASP actually works. I'll go back to dev here for a minute where I don't have RASP engaged. And we'll just, uh, you know, we'll go to this, this API. You can see it just works normally. But if I do a SQL injection, oops. If I do a SQL injection, um, I can exploit this and pull all the records out of the database, right? Well, all I did was add RASP to this application. Now, this is in production. You can see I'm running in, uh, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry here. And now when I try to exploit that same vulnerability, now RASP intervenes and prevents that vulnerability from being exploited. So generally, you can drop in RASP safely into an application and just keep using it. It won't do anything until you actually try to attack the app. Uh, this applies to not only custom code vulnerabilities, so you know the OS Pop 10 kinds of, of vulnerabilities and a bunch more, but also to uh, library vulnerabilities. So all the struts and spring vulnerabilities from last year are almost all expression language injection kinds of problems. Uh, RASP protects against those, those kinds of vulnerabilities and makes them unexploitable. Um, so I think this is really important for every application to have this kind of protection because you're not going to be able to respond to new vulnerabilities that come out in a timely manner. Everyone should know who's attacking and how you're being attacked. And RASP can enable that really easily. And uh, so, you know, look, the, the contrast one here is free. If you've got an application, you want to uh, try it on and see what attacks on your application look like, super easy to add it. Um, and uh, let's see, so I thought what I'd do is I'd show the, uh, the actual attack traffic. You can look at it in the SIM or you can look at it in the, the, the RASP dashboard. Um, 
In this case, I'll show both effective and ineffective attacks. And you can see here, you know, the kind of range of attacks. This is, uh, you can see here, there's, uh, you know, expression language injection, CVE attacks coming in, SQL injection attempts. And then I'll look into this one that we just did a minute ago. And RASP is a little different than what you'd get from a WAF. RASP shows you the attack in the URL here. You can see it's encoded. And it flows through into the SQL query. Basically a lot like what I asked showed you for the vulnerability. But uh, no, other, you know, no other attack detection can really show you the actual query that was targeted. And of course, you get the details, like the full stack trace, full line of code, uh, even the currently logged in user. Because I asked as part of the application, it knows who's logged in. So instead of blocking an IP address, you can go and turn off that user's account or you know, make them reset their password or something because they're attacking you. So you can respond a lot differently. Um, OK, so uh, that's I asked and RASP. And, and I think we went through building this pipeline. It's not difficult to build an effective DevSecOps pipeline using I asked and RASP. You don't have to change anything about the way that your pipeline works. You can layer I asked and RASP on top of your pipeline uh, and, and get these kind of results. So I think I, I did what I set out to do. I wanted to show you that we can empower developers to fix their own vulnerabilities and check in clean code without irritating them. We can assure that build before it goes into production and make sure we're committing, uh, you know, uh, deploying code that doesn't have vulnerabilities. Uh, and we can protect applications, whether they're legacy applications or new applications, we can protect them against being exploited uh, by both old vulnerabilities and new vulnerabilities. And we can do it without, uh, you know, without breaking software development processes and without complex diagrams and so on. So this to me is what AppSec at scale looks like. We instrument our application portfolio and we start getting real time telemetry. We're measuring everything that we're doing. And this is, you know, fundamentally, instrumentation is incredibly important. Everything that we build in the world that's complicated, we instrument it. Like factories and cars and nuclear power plants and so on. They're all super instrumented for temperature and vibration and sound and everything. But we don't instrument software. Software is arguably the most complex thing that man has ever built, and we have no idea what's going on inside. All we got is log files. There's garbage in log files. <laughs> uh, we need to know what's going on inside. And so security instrumentation, uh, I believe, is the path towards achieving continuous AppSec at scale. Uh, and I did want to just mention the, the community edition. We're trying to do something special here. You know, there's 21 million developers in the world. And my estimate is that about 6% of them have access to any kind of decent application security tools. That's, that's a shame. We're never going to get in front of the problem of AppSec with that situation. So we're making uh, the contrast is full strength analysis and protection for one application. We're doing Java right now. But soon we'll be releasing the other languages that we support, uh, .NET, Node.js, Ruby, and Python. Um, and so we can bring great protection to massive amounts of applications across the world and make the situation much better. So please check it out. If you have any questions about it, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, we do have a booth uh, there. If you want to see it, we can show it to you. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop. I do want you to go fast and be secure, and I'd be happy to take your questions uh, for the next few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is a question. So, obviously, all, all are a big problem. For sure. Uh, they are the reason that I started this company. <laughs> Testing? Yeah. So good. false positives are a big problem. And if you have RASP automatically uh, blocking what it perceives as security incidents, you run the risk of blocking your legitimate innocent customers if you have a bad false positive rate. So how do you account for that when you're dealing with RASP? Yeah, I mean, generally, uh, instrumentation is far more accurate than you know, just looking at HTTP requests. So with accuracy comes better protection. Uh, it's really just that simple. You know, we, we have a hard rule. We call it our, uh, our Hippocratic Oath that we'll never break an app. 
And so we, we work really hard to make sure that, you know, the only things that we block are legit attacks. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more detail there, and I, I can, I'd be happy to go into that with you uh, offline. Yes. Um, so you might envision that the DevOps, the engineering teams, uh, might raise a, a question about the performance impacts. Oh, yeah. Of Every IS time. Or RASP, and so I wanted to uh, get your feedback on what yeah. one might expect in terms of performance feedbacks, interoperability, yep. other conflicts um, that one might expect from integrating those technologies in, be they other technologies or Yeah, yours. sure. So two things there. Uh, first of all, RASP is really fast. Uh, Contrast adds about 50 microseconds to a round trip HTTP request. That's for normal traffic. For heavy attacks, that goes up to about 250 microseconds or quarter of a millisecond. So way faster than a WAF. I suspect it's faster than most organizations would be able to add input validation to their code because most developers will do something relatively naive, like use regexes or something. Uh, RASP is woven right into the code, so it's executing in this, the same way that your own developer's validation will work, but it's highly optimized for speed and, and performance. So I, I, I think you know, performance for most applications is not an issue. Um, you mentioned conflict with other things in the environment, and uh, uh, in the first few years, we had conflicts with some of the APM agents because they run in the same way, but uh, that's essentially gone now. We run right alongside Dynatrace and AppDynamics and New Relic and a bunch of other stuff in production. And frankly, I'm, I'm super glad that those products are out there because they blaze the way for this. Operations teams are open to adding uh, this kind of agent to applications because they're used to it. Yeah, so the, the, like I said, the, the community edition is just Java for now, but uh, we're going to add the languages that we, the other languages that we already support and have supported for years. We just, we're doing one at a time because we wanted to kind of, you know, uh, take one step at a time. But uh, that's .NET, Node.js, Ruby, and Python. Yeah. And there's other languages coming, uh, even languages like Go, like native compile languages. Yeah. Yeah. Any plans for Node.js, Express, you know, something like on the Mern stack, React, anything? JavaScript? Yeah, based? yeah, so Node.js is uh, supported. Like, well, I mean, the, in our commercial product. It's not in the community edition yet, but we'll be there. And actually, it's interesting. JavaScript is insanely hard to analyze statically because it's a weekly type language. It's got a million issues. <laughs> but uh, so most static tools really are just kind of grep for, you know, uh, security problems. But because instrumentation happens at runtime, everything's fully resolved. And so you know, we don't have the same kinds of, of problems analyzing JavaScript. So you know, we've got really the, the only technology that works well on server-side JavaScript. Yeah? Uh, does RASP support uh, legacy applications? And also how RASP learn about um, zero-day zero exploits as well as emerging yeah. Vulnerabilities. Great questions. No, really, really great. So, um, yeah, you can drop in RASP on a legacy application. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's dynamic binary instrumentation, so you don't even have to have the source code, right? You can just add it to a server. You can even add it to commercial products. Uh, and it just goes to work right away. Uh, second part of your question is about, uh, you know, how do updates happen for, for new things? Most zero days are instances of some vulnerability that uh, RASP already protects against, right? So like if a new spring expression language vulnerability comes out, it's already been protected against by RASP because RASP makes expression language injection impossible to exploit. Um, and I, could, I could dig into the details of that, but it's, you know, we're, we're sandboxing the actual evaluation of the expression. But if there is something genuinely novel, like some new kind of injection, uh, OWASP injection or something, <laughs> uh, then uh, you want an update to go out. So everything in, in our environment, everything automatically updates. So new rules go out. You can, it can push out across your entire application portfolio in a matter of minutes, and then you're protected. Um, so yeah, I think that's important to look for, you know, how does it update over time? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate the time. Thanks.